Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Through the wonder of YouTube, my last sermon was actually put online, and so my two brothers from Wisconsin and Indiana were able to watch and critique <laughs> my last sermon. My oldest brother, Rick, said it was good, but stepped away from the podium occasionally. All right, Rick. <laughs> David, my second oldest brother, is a man of few words. He has three. Good. Too long. <laughs> I don't know if I can do anything about that. Because we are continuing this morning a series that will take us to the end of the summer uh, called The Way of Wisdom, Ancient Wisdom for a Modern World. Last week, Pastor Brian started us off by looking at the book of Proverbs and James, which says, If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. This morning, we're going to remain in the book of Proverbs for a little bit, but we're also going to gain some wisdom from four other individuals. Bill Hybels, Gustavo Gutierrez, Spike Lee, and Martin Luther. Through these four individuals, we are going to learn that the wisdom that comes down from God is this. When you look for the source of sins, there you'll find man. And when you look at the source of a man, there you'll find sin. I read this week in the Tacoma News Tribune uh, about the city of New Orleans and how it's rebounding seven years hence from Hurricane Katrina. Uh, some of the exiles are returning to New Orleans and finding their city actually a much better place than when they left it before the disaster. Uh, the Brookings Institute reported that 40%, there's, there's a 40% increase in startups in New Orleans. So it's a city that is, uh, is becoming an entrepreneurial city. And uh, it's, so it's good news that way. And uh, also it is the fastest growing major city in the United States since the 2010 census. Good news there. All those things are great. Uh, on the other hand, uh, it is still the murder capital of our country, and uh, despite the efforts of uh, Brad Pitt uh, and some of the energy-efficient homes that he's building there, only 5% of the people in the Ninth Ward have actually moved back to their neighborhood. So it's a, there's a dichotomy going there between the richest or the, or the, the middle class and the, the poorest people who are still without homes there. For three years in a row, our church went to Camp Restore in New Orleans, uh, and this is sort of the before picture of that yard that we worked at, and then there's the uh, there's the after. So we did you know, we did some nice work there in the community, helping to rebuild homes and <coughs> excuse me, and uh, actually uh, re, uh, not rebuilding but also remodeling some of the homes there, and just sort of generally cleaning up in the area. <coughs> excuse me, and uh, we were both. I mean, we, we helped New Orleans, but again, New Orleans helped us in terms of giving us an opportunity to uh, work uh, for people who really need a lot of help. And it was a really good experience for uh, a lot of the people there who went, and also the people who received our help. After the second year that we went to New Orleans, I watched two documentaries. One was uh, an Oscar-winning documentary called Trouble the Water. It was a first-person perspective lady with a camera on her second story of her house filmed the entire thing from her perspective from beginning to end. It was, it was very emotional, very moving. She also talked about her aftermath, how she tried to rebound and move back to her house. The other was by uh, Spike Lee, and uh, his documentary was called When the Levees Broke. And uh, he, he looked at uh, the, the, the problem from the perspective of what caused the unmaking of New Orleans. He came up with total systemic failure. He had, uh, he said, starting with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, they built really bad levees in the poorest parts of New Orleans. Um, the insurance companies who refused to pay out money that they for the insured homes that, uh, that they, they people had paid their policies and still lost their homes entirely because of uh, words or commas or semicolon. Um, but the, the local government, who did not provide adequate police protection, the state government, who did not provide adequate evacuation plans, and the federal government for, well, being federal government, there's not a lot you can say. 
in their favor on a lot of things. Okay, but what, uh, so Spike Lee looked uh, for the source of New Orleans' problems and found corrupt and failing systems. Bill Hybels is one of the most influential Christians in our country, along with Rick Warren. He is the pastor of Willow Creek uh, Church in Barrington, Illinois, one of the very influential, uh, uh, Willow Creek is uh, influential not, among, not only among Christian leaders, but non-Christian leaders as well. Uh, when Bill Heibel speaks, he speaks very passionately and from his heart. When Bill Heibel speaks, churches listen, including this one, because a lot of the programs that we have here are from uh, Willow Creek, and we've, we've gained a lot from his leadership seminars. Well, uh, Bill started talking about Christian-based justice. I was listening to a, a podcast of his a couple of weeks ago. Um, and he started, like most Americans, caring for the poor by going somewhere else. Um, he needed to go to a place where he was able to see poverty, to taste it, to uh, smell it, touch it, to lose sleep over it, in his words, to throw up over it. This place happens to be Uganda, and like a good American with resources, he was able to do something about their problems. He bought something. It started with a solar-powered uh, water purifier, you know, because uh, a child that he grew very close with died of a waterborne illness because the child drank from the river that was uh, flowing right by their community. And so uh, he got bought a solar-powered water purifier. It cleaned up the toxins from the river, and so the people in that community could drink clean water. Problem solved, right? So Bill washed his hands, patted himself on the back, and left that place. That's where God wanted him, he thought. That's where God needed him. Until he was confronted by Richard Curtis, who says, uh, Richard Curtis is a producer of films like Four Weddings and a Funeral and uh, Bridget Jones Diary, a British guy, not Christian, by the way. He shamed Bill by saying, you can't buy yourself out of a problem. You actually have to go there and be in the community to, in order to, to have the authority to, to preach the gospel to them. So he partnered with local churches sent a team over there, the men's ministry took it on, much like our men's ministry has taken on Nia Bay and the Macaw Indians, uh, which, by the way, they're going on a mission at the end of uh, next month, I believe it is, so if you want to join them, that's awesome. Anyway, Bill sent this men's ministry team, and they actually uh, partnered with some of the churches there. They stayed in the community uh, to solve the community's problems, and so, uh, you know, that's great, so problem solved, right? Bill washed his hands, patted himself on the back, and left the place in good hands. That's where God wanted me, Bill thought. That's where God needed me. Well, people in the community reported back, you know, the real problem isn't the water purifier. Water purifiers are great, fantastic. The real problem is the soap factory upriver, which is polluting the river, which caused the, the toxins in the first place. Well, we have a problem here, right? So the soap factory is polluting the river. So Bill used his influence to go to Uganda and say, look, you gotta clean up the foot. The soap factory actually closed down, and when they reopened, no more pollutants in the river. Bill patted himself on the back, said, uh, and he left the place in good's hand, thinking that's where God wanted me, that's where God needed me. Well, the real problem wasn't the polluted river necessarily, but the people were in an impoverished village, and they were impoverished because the factory owner wasn't paying living wages. So they wanted they needed money for food, clothing, and education. And so Bill used his influence and talked to the people in the factory and gave them that everybody's got a living wage. And so now, really, all the problems of the community are, are solved because you know Bill uses influence as a, a, a nice Christian guy. And uh, he, he got a hold of the corrupt uh, factory owners, and they paid the, the, their owners uh, a living wage. So Bill Hybels looked for the source of Uganda's problems and found corrupt and failing systems. In continually looking for the source of the problem, Bill Hybels finally got to where Spike Lee got seven years ago. And they both ultimately got to where Peruvian theologian Gustavo Gutierrez began in 1971. The place they all got to is something called systemic sin, which refers to corrupt and sin-ridden systems created by sinful people, leading to a population who feel powerless to do anything about it. 
The remedy to systemic sin, according to Gutierrez, is liberation theology. Now, if you've heard of liberation theology, it's probably in a pretty negative way. Reverend Jeremiah Wright made a, a big stint a couple of years back, and people looked at him and thought, oh my gosh, this is the religion of socialism. This is Christian Marxism. This is a terrible thing. Um, and it, it, it was based on, uh, the, their fear was based on uh, the, ninth, the political priests in Nicaragua in the 1980s who not only said, you know, this is an oppressive system, but they did something about it. They violently overthrew uh, the politicians in that area and then became corrupt politicians themselves, which is against what the Pope wanted and against Catholic doctrine. So these sort of rogue priests that said, you know, we need to side with, um, be on the side of the poor and violently overthrow our oppressors. And so that's where you get kind of a, some of the scary ideas uh, about liberation theology, because in order to oppose the uh, oppressors, you sometimes need to resort to violence, which is not exactly what Jesus would do, uh, in, according to us. So, um, so, but, but Gutierrez began at the same place that Heibel's ended up. If you really want to help people, you need to go to the source of their problem. For Heibel's, the problem was clean water. So he bought a water purifier and then cleaned at the factory. Uh, if you're Gutierrez, he, what he saw was unjust and oppressive political systems, but, and both of them looked to resolve the source of the problem, and both of them looked to the Bible as their inspiration. Because in its purest form, liberation theology seeks to end widespread poverty nonviolently by reading the scripture through the eyes of the poor, according to Philip Berryman. So take, for example, Jesus in the temple, right? So Jesus slays the money changers, and they're selling sheep and cattle and, and dogs and horses and everything, and right outside the temple gate. So he takes a whip and drives them out, turns it over the tables of the money changers. We think, you know, the traditional uh, interpretation of that is that Jesus was zeal for his, the house consumed, and so he really wanted the worship space to be pure and not, you know, saddled with commerce. Um, now, a liberation theologian would look at that and say, because the people that were being uh, hurt in this case were the poor women and Gentiles, because that's the only place they could actually hear the teaching from the temple, that's where the people were being sold, they said, Jesus is siding with the poor and violently overthrowing the oppressors. See how that kind of works? See, you can kind of make that, kind of uh, read that in a different way? Okay. Um, Likewise, in, uh, in Proverbs that we read for today, on the subject of justice, you know, you could make that seem like, you know, you're really looking to pay your workers on time. Do not withhold from those to whom it is due when it is in your power to do it. Do not say to your neighbor, go and come again tomorrow, I will give it when you have it with you. Um, so you could look at that as being, you know, owners, pay your workers on time. If you don't, bad things. Uh, the oppressed poor could overthrow the wicked it, it would be one way to read the second proverb. When it goes well with the righteous, the city rejoices. And when the wicked perish, there are shouts of gladness. By the blessing of the upright, a city is exalted. But by the mouth of the wicked, it is overthrown. Read from a liberation theologian the perspective, you could actually see that the poor need to throw off that the unjust uh, system so that they're uh, being languishing under. Liberation theology, they started with the goodness of creation in the Bible. They look at that and say, this is the way God wants it to be. We need to get back to Eden. And, and in order to do that, we need to throw off oppression. Uh, look, they look very closely at the Exodus story, where God sides from the people, the slaves, the Israelites were slaves, and he moved them away from the oppressive Egyptians. The liberation theologians really take a, take a good look at Amos or some of the prophets who are saying that you know the Israelites are really oppressing the poor. But the trouble with reading scripture in this way is that uh, they're not really finding the proper source of the problem. It's not necessarily the systems that are the problem. This is where Martin Luther comes to the rescue. Because, believe it or not, this sermon is not about politics. It's about you. It's about me. Because when you look for the source of sins, there you'll find man. 
And when you look at the source of a man, there you'll find sin. You have a gambling problem. You go to the casinos a little bit too much, play the lottery religiously. You win a few, you get up, you got a hot streak, can't be beat. Bam, the house wins. You realize you need to stop gambling. So you stop going to the casinos, you stop buying the lottery ticket. It's not the real source of your problem. The real source of your problem is that you're addicted to risk. And so you start texting and driving. You start drinking and driving. You start texting and drinking and driving. Because the odds are ever in your favor. But that's not the real source of your problem either. The real source of your problem is your sin. I have a gossip problem. I whisper about this guy's eating problem. He eats too little. She eats too much. You know it's really a self-esteem problem. They're, they're, they're going to marriage counseling. The Sprats. Um, because their marriage is on the rocks. Uh, because of it, Mr. and Mrs. Sprat. So, uh, Christian points out my problem, and I go to counseling and stop gossiping. That's not the real source of my problem. The real source of my problem is that I need to make myself feel better by making you feel worse. The real source of my problem is that I'm a sinner. We have American problems. My skin is too white. Your body is shaped all wrong. I have a foam Dick Tracy never dreamed of, but it's not as good as yours. You have a thread count way under 300. I have to parallel park my car all by myself, manually. My food is not grown within 10 miles of where I live. So, you go tanning, you get a lipo, you talk to Siri, you camp out for the Macy's White Sale, lease a Lexus with Auto Park, and drive 20 miles to Trader Joe's. But that's not the source of our problem, which is that we are vain and covetous, which is that we don't know what real problems are. What real problems are is that our, at our source, we are sinners. You're a PhD student. You like Batman. You walk into a theater and kill or injure 71 people in a little under five minutes using semi-automatic weapons and head-to-toe body armor, all purchased legally in this country. You terrorize an entire nation. The hue and cry for stricter gun laws goes up. There is weeping. There is gnashing of teeth. There is tighter security at midnight meetings. There is great fear. There is a desire for more control. That is the sin of Adam. James Holmes has revealed the source of sin to us. We want to be able to protect ourselves. We want to be able to control our own lives. And that is the ultimate source of the problem. The problem of original sin. When you look for the source of sins, there you will find man. And when you look for the source of a man, there you will find sin. This is one of Martin Luther's greatest contributions to the history of Christianity. Luther discovered in Scripture God's un incontrovertible, unassailable, do not pass go, do not collect $200, holy law. Everywhere we turn, that's where we find our sin, Luther said. We cannot escape the wrath of God by ourselves. We are eternally condemned. We cannot get out of it. We're sunk. There is nothing we can do by our strength to move ourselves into a position of moral superiority because we humans are all in this miserable condition of original sin together. Or in the words of Paul, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? We are in a helpless condition. That's where God wants us. That's where God needs us. That's where we need God. The other of Martin Luther's greatest contributions to the history of Christianity is discovering in Scripture God's incontrovertible, unassailable, free parking, holy gospel. In our darkest despair, that's where the light of Christ shines brightest. 
That's where his universe-saving sacrifice on the cross becomes a lighthouse in a sea of hopelessness. Our sin is no more. There is no more condemnation. When Luther discovered that we are made right before God, not by anything we do, but by the sheer grace of God, he wrote, Thereupon I felt myself to be reborn and to have gone through open doors into paradise. That's where God needs us. That's where God wants us. That's where we need God. My prayer for you is that you begin to see this cause, some of the causes of systemic sin, and ask yourself, as a Christian, what can I do to replace unjust systems with systems that help the least of these, my brothers and sisters? My prayer for you is that you begin to realize that sin is reality in this life in the systems we have created, but more importantly, that sin is a reality in your life, in my life, and we cannot get rid of it by removing the effects of sin in our lives. My prayer for you is that you know that even though you are a sinner, even though I am a sinner, God loved us so much that he sent his son to save us. Let's pray. Gracious and loving Father in heaven, Confess that we are sinners incapable of saving ourselves. We thank you for your precious gift of salvation bought with the price of your son's suffering and death on the cross. We know that without you, we would be lost in our sin. Instead, we glory in your salvation. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace.